From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Pat McCracken at Universal Adjustment Bureau. Hiya, Patsy. What's in your mind? Had your fortune told lately? Nope, but I don't think I want to. The last time it came true. Oh, what was it? Well, this Madame Gaga went into a transom or whatever you call it. and oh, trans, boys, if you didn't know. Yeah, anyhow, she told me I was going to become an insurance investigator. And I've been stuck with it ever since. <laughs> sad, sad. But now, how'd you like to try your hand as a psychic investigator? Sure. What do I do? Uh, drop over, will you? I'm on my way. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. <laughs> Expense account item one, 115. Taxi to the office of Pat McCracken at Universal. I hadn't seen Pat since he'd ruined my Southern California vacation by insisting I tie it in with the Jolly Roger matter in the Lamar case, where my expense account, for some uh, strange reason, came out to a right nice figure. I've even included the case of V.O. that I'd sent him for having handed me those investigations. So I didn't know whether he was going to be nice to me or to rub my nose in the dirt. As it turned out, he didn't know either. Now, I don't quite know whether this is going to be another soft touch for that expense account of yours, or a completely crazy one, or real rough. <laughs> Tommy Green seems to think the latter, though I don't see why particularly. Yeah, who's Tommy Green? Mid-Eastern life down in New York. Oh, but just bill me as usual. Sure, okay. Now, Tommy says he's run into this sort of thing before, but not on so big a scale. That's why he's worried about it. Pat, you still what? haven't told me what. Oh, <laughs> Now, one of his clients happens to be a sweet young thing named Carol Sharp, 26 or 7, beautiful, badly spoiled. Mm, love him that way. What? No, nothing. Go on, go on. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, she lives alone in a swank penthouse in the East 50s down there in New York, playgirl. Tommy holds a $110,000 policy on her. Straight life. Beneficiary? Her family, mother, and a couple of kid brothers. No father? No, no. The others live over in Machunk, PA. That's where her father made the dough that keeps her in the penthouse and keeps the others living well in the old family man. So, what's the problem? Somebody threatening her life? I don't know, Johnny. It depends on what you mean by threatening. She's just requested Tommy to change beneficiaries. What's so unusual about that? Well, one of them is to be a man named Tony Ricardo for 30000 oh, oh, so she's fallen for the guy and is making the uh, nice gesture. Uh, maybe. We don't know yet. The other is a so-called medium... Madam Celia something. Uh-uh. I've heard it before. Turn the family fortune over to me and I'll get in touch with dear departed Papa. That's what it looks like from here. She's being took. But how could it be any of our business? Well, last time Tommy was requested to change a beneficiary to a medium, his hale and hearty young client suddenly turned up dead. And they pinned it on the medium? Mm-hmm. Apparently this sort of thing goes on quite a bit. So it has Tommy worried, so he asked for you. All right, just what's he want me to do? What do you want to do? Break out the old crystal ball, Pat, and we'll see. Expense account item two, transportation, Hartford to New York, and the offices of Mideastern, where Tommy Green turned out to be a mild-mannered, thoroughly likable, successful insurance broker. Come in, Mr. Dollar. Glad you could make it. I do, Mr. Green. Sit down, won't you? Thanks. Mm -hmm. I suppose Pat McCracken's told you what's on my mind. Only that you think one of your clients is being taken for the proverbial sleigh ride by some spiritualist. As you no doubt know, Mr. Dollar, spiritualism is a recognized, well-established religion. Sure, of course. However, as in any other, there are charlatans. And some of these mediums, as they call themselves, take literally millions of dollars every year from people by trickery, by producing weird manifestations that appear to be genuinely supernatural. Tommy, I know what you mean. My own mother took a beating from one of those phonies when I was just a kid. You know, promised messages from father after he died, and at 25 bucks a try. Wow. No wonder you're suspicious of them. And especially of one Madame Celia Morgana Morgana. Have you seen this, uh, madam? No, but I believe you'd better. Mm-hmm. Have you changed what's her name, Carol Sharp's policy yet? No, but I'm afraid I can't stall her much longer. And you're afraid that once you do change it, Carol ain't going to be long for this world, huh? It's happened before, darling. Yeah. Well, I, I can't just barge in on this Madame Morgana Morgana, announce that I'm an insurance investigator, and then another... 
Hey, wait a minute. Uh, what's the name of this other beneficiary? Tony Ricardo. Yeah, who is he? All I know is what Carol's told me. Love affair? Yeah. He sounds like a playboy. They do a lot of nightclubbing together. Money? I don't know. Family? I don't know that either. But he's in for 30 of the 110,000 if anything happens to her. If we change the policy. How are you going to start? Well, if this Carol Sharp is all Pat McCracken says she is, this case could have a very pleasant beginning. I stuck around with Tommy Green long enough to listen to him verify what Pat had said about Carol's family, wealth, etc. Take a look at a snapshot of her and get her address. Item 3180, taxi to the Bell Towers at 614 East 52nd Street. A magnificent modern apartment hotel at the edge of the East River. Real swank. The place even had its own private docks with several well-kept cruisers tied up and even a small seaplane. Pat, I warn you, this expense account ain't going to be small. Yes, may I help you, sir? Yes, you can. I'd uh, like a small apartment for a few days. Are you alone, sir? Yes. Well, we still have a small five-room penthouse suite for $1,500 a month. Huh? With complete maid service, of course. Oh, of course. And on a minimum one-year lease, of course. Look, all I want is a bedroom, living room type of thing, and I may be here only a week or so. Oh, well, in that case, I'm afraid there's nothing we can do for you unless... Tell me, sir, do you have any recommendations from any of our tenants? Look, I'm an insurance investigator. Here, my card. Oh. And I want something as close as possible to Miss Carol Sharp's apartment. But I don't want to have to rob four banks. Private Dax. investigator, did you say? Yeah, that'll do. Oh, dear. Surely Miss Sharp can't be in any kind of... Well, I mean, think what it would mean to our reputation, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Stop worrying, will you? She isn't in any kind of trouble yet. But for reasons that, uh, well, they don't particularly concern you, I need to be as close to her as I can. Ah, uh -huh, what a pleasant thought. And if for the same I... reason, I don't want her to know what my business here is. Of course. Believe me, Mr. Dollar, I'm the very soul of discretion. Good. See that you stay that way. Now, have you got a room or two for me? Oh, let me see. Now, she's in penthouse A on floor 12. Hmm. There is a two-room on 10, very nice, at 325 a week. <laughs> With uh, complete service, of course. Okay, I'll take it. Very well. Just sign this card, please. And, uh, oh, dear, I'm afraid I must have a week in advance. Oh, oh sure, sure. What's a measly 325 bucks? <laughs> when the two bellboys who carried up my two bags at a buck apiece settled me in 1013, I must admit the place looked almost worth a ten. Tastefully furnished, spit and polished clean, and with a plate glass panorama view of the bustling East River. Yeah, I wish for a moment that I could afford this sort of lodging. First thing I did was telephone to an old pal. Detective Division, Sergeant Singer. Hey, look, Sarge. I need a rundown on a dirty crook. Well, who's speaking, please? He's going around acting like an insurance stick, but he's a crook. Oh, what's his name? Dollar, Johnny Dollar. And I tell you, that punk is as crooked as he can. Don't go any further. We know all about him. We got word here in New York that we'll put a stake out on him the minute we spot his hideout. That copper I can give you. <laughs> Good, Johnny. Just where you <laughs> staying. Hi, you old reprobate. I'm at the Towers. He's 52nd. The Towers? Expense account, huh? How'd you guess? I want to see you. In exactly 21 minutes, I'll punch the time clock and be over. Room 1013. Right. Oh, and uh, be sure it's with soda. Easy, boy. Give you any encouragement, you'll want to name the brand of scotch. <laughs> Item 4, 12, 20. One bottle of scotch and setups for two. Sure, Johnny. Knew her from when I was doing the nightclub beat. And she's lived in town for quite a while, huh? Yeah, a couple of years at least. How much do you know about her, Randy? Hmm, not much. Uh, she's loaded, throws her money around like it's confetti. Yeah, I figured that when I found her staying here. Father left it to her. Hmm, coal miner, wasn't he? Owned a big colliery in Frankville, Pennsylvania, somewhere near Mockchunk. Well, it must have paid off good in the old days, uh, but tell me, what's... Uh, uh, you want to give me a refill? Yeah, sure. Ever hear of a Madame Senior Morgana Morgana? Huh! I've chased that blousy old phony from one end of the island to the other. I look into the crystal ball, and I see into the past, the present, the future, and into your pocketbook. Yeah, and, man, she could. I think she's operating somewhere over on the Jersey side now. Oh, yeah. Thanks. But she's still operating. Operating with real class. Last time we picked her up and kicked her out. How do you mean? Nice apartment over here on the east side. Classy clientele. Mm -hmm. Hey, is uh, Carol Sharp hooked by her? Pierce so. Just how does she work? Well, the usual way the phonies do. Goes into a trance, writhes around like a seasick rattlesnake, uh, then gives with the voices. Voices? You know, speaks with the tongues of the departed. 
Hey, look, where's the money angle? Mr. Well, she makes like the trances cause her great agony of body and mind. Starts with the pitch about doctor bills. And the more clients can afford, the more they pay. And they don't get wise? Yeah, she's smart. Works it like a serial story. You know, continued next week? No, I don't know. Brief me. Well, at each seance, she tells them just enough to whet their appetite for more. Leads right up to the next hot bit of information, has them hanging on every word, then bingo, the trance is over. Ah. Uh-huh. However, if you come back next week when I recover my strength, <laughs> so they pay her off and they're back a week later to play games with her again. I don't know. It seems pretty obvious to me. Well, that's because you've never attended a seance run by an artist at it. Hey, why don't you? I think I will. I'll see what I can dig up for you. You mean there are still some going on around town? Some. <laughs> Dozens, hundreds, probably. Kick them out of one place, they move to another, unless you can tie a serious rap on them. Which reminds me, Tommy Green told yeah, me... Yeah, yeah, I handled that one myself, a Madame Gabor Chernarsky. Got a sweet old man to sign over his fortune, then had him knocked off. Oh, that's a dirty rack. Yeah, religion, science, the professions, they all leave an open door to the racketeers, I guess. Okay, set up a seance for me, Randy. In the meantime... Yeah? Run me a make on Tony Ricardo, will you? Ricardo. Yeah, he's the other one Carol Sharp wants to name as a beneficiary. Besides the medium? Yeah. Beneficiary of a whopping big life policy. Okay, good, Johnny. I'll call you later. When I took my time showering and changing clothes, I racked my brain trying to cook up a smooth way to meet Carol Sharp. Under no circumstances did I want her to suspect the reason behind my interest in her, at least not for the present. Requisite number one, then, meet the gal. I was just tying my time when the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Randy, Johnny. Oh, hi, Rand. Set up a date with a medium? Yeah, for tonight, but that's not what I'm calling about. Johnny, I could write a book for you. Huh? On Tony Ricardo, and I don't think you'd like it. Have you seen him yet? No, but I will, as soon as I can locate him. Well, if he finds out what you're working on, he'll locate you. Fine. Yeah, just be sure you see him first, and that you're carrying a gun. Thanks, Randy. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, sometimes the best laid plans can take a terrible beating when a lovely girl steps into the picture. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Randy Singer at headquarters, Johnny. Oh, hi. More information on Tony Ricardo? Only what I told you before. Look out for him. Randy, that doesn't sound like anybody that a gal like Carol Sharp would be associated with. Who knows? For a cut of her money, most anybody would be willing to act like a nice old coot. Till he got his hands on it. Yeah, I know what you mean. But now I thought you were going to set up a seance for me. Or couldn't you find a crystal ball? I'm working on it. I'll call you. Yeah, do that. Tonight, and every weekday night... Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York City. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. Three people to look up immediately. First, Carol Sharp, wealthy heiress who insisted on a funny change in the beneficiaries of a whopping big life insurance policy. Second, a questionable character named Tony Ricardo, who was scheduled to be one of those beneficiaries. Third in the same category as Tony, one Madame Celia Morgana Morgana, self-styled psychic medium. Instead, I huddled with Tommy Green, the broker who handled Carol Sharp's policy. But you haven't even seen Carol yet? No. Johnny, I can't stall off changing the beneficiaries of her policy much longer. You've got to do something about this. Because you don't like mediums? This one is a fake. Or you don't like playboys with foreign names? Listen, Johnny. I'm afraid that once she names them in her policy, her body will suddenly turn up floating around somewhere in the East River. But what if I find they're okay? In spite of the opinion of Sergeant Singer of the NYPD. What did he say? Oh, not much. But he hinted that when I meet Ricardo, I'd better be carrying a gun. Well, don't you see? That's exactly what I'm driving at. As for the medium, 
Well, Tommy, you know as well as I do, there are a lot of perfectly legitimate, honest spiritualist churches all Believe over the Believe me, Johnny, if this one ever saw the inside of a church, it'd be a miracle. She's a fraud. How do you know? Ever met her? I know how these phonies operate. Ever met her? No, no, I haven't. I haven't the least idea where to look for her. That's why I sent for you. But you haven't even seen Carol yet. Now, look. Tommy, I've taken a place in her apartment hotel, the Bell Towers. Oh, you expense account boys. And I'll meet her as soon as I can, in my own way. Meanwhile, I want you to do something for me. If it'll help to get things moving, anything. Find out some more about the beneficiary she wants to cut off. Her mother and two brothers out in Marchunk, Pennsylvania. Find out how they're doing financially, among other things. How, Johnny? Hire another investigator? I take it that you don't want them to know about it. Well, uh, why don't you cook up some kind of a news item about Carol, the local girl in the big city, and phone it into the local newspaper editor. Those small-town papers love that sort of stuff, and the editor will probably talk his head off about the family if you encourage him a bit. Hmm. What kind of a news item? Oh, anything that's harmless. Sounds like something you'd be better at than I am. Tommy, I've got other things to do. Plenty. Armed with the snapshot of Carol, I took a cab to the Bell Towers. And I hoped that somehow, and without making it too corny or obvious, I could figure a way to get next to Carol Sharp. As it turned out, it was both corny and successful. You see, the automatic elevator in the Towers is a slow one. Will you push the button for 12, please? Oh, surely, miss. I'm only going to the... What's the matter? Uh, Huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Here, I'll push it. No, no, no. I beg your pardon. I... Well, I'm sorry, but I... I can't believe this. Unless I'm psychic. Now, look, mister. This city is too big and sophisticated for... Is something wrong with you? You did want to get off on the 10th floor, didn't you? Yes. Yes, I did. Well, we're here. Floor 10, so... Mister, did somebody hypnotize you? Hypnotize? Yes. Uh, No. Oh, Oh, please, miss, excuse me. It's... it's, Well, it's just that I can't believe... Oh, I'm I'm terribly sorry. When I was a kid, I used to have a dream over and over again about a beautiful girl, and her name was Carol. What? The same dream over and over, and it... Well, it, it startled me just now because... Well, because you look just like she did. Oh, but it's all nonsense, and I know it, and I apologize. Carol, did you say? Yes, but it was just a dream, and probably I just imagined that you resemble her, and I'm terribly sorry. I, I, I know what this must look like to you. Yes, like a veridical dream. What? A truth dream. It's a psychic phenomenon. Oh, that. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't believe in that sort of stuff. Oh? Well, it just happens that there are thousands of cases on record and by people of uh, reputation and responsibility. Oh, sure, sure. But now, excuse me, and uh, again, I want to apologize for this, uh, well, this embarrassing moment. Goodbye. I could see over my shoulder that she left the elevator door open until I'd gone into my suite across the hall. I sat down next to the broad window overlooking the East River, crossed my fingers, and waited. Ten minutes. Fifteen. Uh, hello? Mr. Dollar? Yes, who's that? This is Carol. What? Your dream girl? Uh, Hello? Oh, I get it. I made a fool of myself in the elevator, and now you're rubbing it in. No, I didn't mean it that way. I hope you don't think I'm being forward, but I'd like to talk with you. About your dream, I mean. (laughs) What's that mean? And I was afraid you thought I was trying to pull a fast one in the elevator. But, uh, how did you know who I am? I just asked the desk clerk who was in 1013. My name is Carol Sharp. Then it really is Carol. Well, that's amazing. That's why I want to talk to you. Well, there, uh, there's a nice cocktail lounge downstairs. In half an hour? In half an hour. Bye. Uh, Dollar, you are a fast one. Now, let me see. Huh? Johnny Dollar. Randy Singer. Yeah, I'm on and on. Well, what's the matter? After what I've been talking to, this is a come down. Now, what are you... T- oh, 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 you met Carol Sharp, Sure huh? did. Uh-huh. Oh, look, I've uh, set up the seance I promised. You uh, still want it now that you've uh, met the girl? Sure. I want to find out what this stuff is all about, how those people operate and so on. Want to pick me up here at the Towers? Uh, Why don't you meet me here at headquarters, and you can look over the file on Tony Ricardo. Good idea. I'll be clear any time after six. Better make it around seven. I've got a date for cocktails. 
Are you uh, in town on a case or... With Carol Sharp. To say that Carol looked like a vision when she swept into the cocktail lounge would have been a gross understatement. Her light blue cocktail gown was probably from Hattie Carnegie, but its lines were simple in the extreme, and it only served to accentuate the fresh, lithe figure and the natural beauty of the girl. Her blonde hair was drawn back tightly, and a silver blue mixed stole was draped carelessly over her shoulder. If I'd put on an act when I stared at her in the elevator, believe me, this was no act now. I hope you don't think me too brazen for having called you the way I did. You have no idea how glad I am. Uh, will this be all right? Oh, fine. Thank you. I, uh, I was afraid after that episode in the elevator, you might have thought I was just some lonely bachelor trying to find a date. <laughs> Are you a bachelor? I uh, confirmed. Well, you just haven't met the right girl. <laughs> Well, there are times like this when I think perhaps the... Your order, sir? Uh, oh, sure, point killing. <laughs> Carol? Uh, sherry and bitters, please. Sherry and bitters and V.O. over ice. Thank you, sir. Be honest with me. Do I really look like the girl you used to dream about when you were a little boy? Or did you dream about a, a little girl your own age who just happened to bear some resemblance to me? Well, no. No, you see... That's very important. You see, if it really was a veridical dream, well, you see, the phenomenon of precognition would be involved, too, so to speak. Precognition? Yes, you're now knowing me psychically before you could possibly know about me by any natural means. Uh, where have you lived most of your life? Oh, all over. Here in New York, Hartford, Connecticut. Eastern Pennsylvania? Oh, never, except for an occasional trip to Philadelphia. But that wasn't until I was grown up. Well, then you couldn't possibly have ever actually seen me because all my life I've lived in Pennsylvania and, well, in the coal mining district. Well, uh... So your dreams of me must have been due to some supernatural cause. Ah, uh, There's Carol. no other explanation. Well, is there? Carol, I... Carry in bitters for the lady and... Uh... Yeah, uh, thanks. I'll sign that. Saved by the bell, or rather by the waiter... I'm afraid I came awfully close to admitting to Carol that I'd trumped up the whole dream business just to meet her and talk with her. She was certainly hep on the subject of things psychic, and I'm afraid a natural sucker for anyone who wanted to capitalize on her gullibility. Beautiful, intelligent, well-educated, but, well, you'll see what I mean. And although it's a terrible strain on her, these deep trances, I mean, I've received messages through her, Johnny, from my father. Through this medium? Yes, Madame Morgana Morgana. And your father's dead? He died three years ago. Carol, are you sure about those messages? Oh, yes, Johnny, I'm sure. That's why I want you to go and see. See these things for yourself, will you? Will you go to her with me? <laughs> now, don't swing at me, but at this point, I think I'd go anywhere with you. Johnny, I'm serious. I, I want to tell her about you anyway, and the veridical dreams. Well, all right. When? I'll call her tonight, and perhaps we can see her tomorrow night, all right? Yeah. Carol, I don't want to seem suspicious, but, uh... Yes? Don't tell her anything about me, except that you're bringing me along. Oh, no. No, of course not. She wouldn't let me anyway. That's the way the fraudulent mediums work. Oh? There are frauds among them? Oh, plenty of them. You know, they get the information from some mutual friend and pretend they're getting it from a supernatural source. And she doesn't? I'm sure of it. So far, so good. I'd met Carol Sharp. I'd convinced her, in a snide sort of way, that I was intrigued with this psychic phenomena business. I was well on the way to meeting the medium who had sparked this whole case. And later tonight, thanks to Sergeant Randy Singer of the NYPD, I'd attend a seance calculated to be my first step in finding out how the phonies in the racket impressed their customers. There was just one more person to meet, Tony Ricardo, whom Carol wanted to name, along with the medium, as beneficiary of her big insurance policy. By the time Carol and I finished cocktails, I was sorry I'd made any plans for the evening. But I was already late for my meeting with Randy at headquarters. I took Carol back to her penthouse and then dropped into my own suite to pick up a top coat. Somebody had shoved a note under my door. Mr. Johnny Dollar, if you value your life, you'll stay away from Carol Sharp. It was unsigned. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, 
I find out a thing or two about a killer and about a medium not so well done. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Tony Ricardo. Oh, I've been hoping to get in touch with you. Did you receive my note? Was that your polite threat to kill me if I don't leave Carol Sharp alone? Yeah, I received it. And I have a sneaking suspicion the police department might be interested in it. No. No, please, I... I guess I acted a bit hastily. Perhaps you let me talk to you. You want to take the threat back? That still stands. Then you don't leave me much choice. Talk to me first. Believe me, you won't be sorry. But I might be dead. Is that it? I want to see you. Can't do it now, but where can I reach you? Sunrise 3, 9970. Okay. Meantime, don't get trigger happy. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York City, to the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. Expense account item 7, 85 cents. Cab fare from the Bell Towers to the 18th Precinct Station and Sergeant Randy Singer. So, you met Carol Sharp, huh? Yep. I put on an act that would have done credit to the theater guild. <laughs> told her she looked exactly like a girl I dreamed about as a kid, a girl named Carol. Oh, no. She swallowed it? Not only that, but she gave me a lecture on veridical dreams, an allied psychic phenomenon. <laughs> you deserve an Oscar. Also, she wants me to go with her and see this Madame Morgana Morgana. Oh, good. When? Tomorrow night. Well, you're not figuring on skipping tonight's seance, are you? Oh, no, not a bit. I want to find out what this stuff is all about, so I'll be prepared for tomorrow. Uh, this dame you have lined up pretty good? She's got a big following. You ready to go? Oh, wait a minute. You said you have the file on Tony Ricardo. Oh, yeah, yeah, here it is, waiting for you. Yeah. Anthony Ricardo, alias Ricky Marino, alias Tony the Tip. There, here's his picture. Height 5'9", weight 172, eyes brown, hey, hair sparse gray, suspected member of the Dutchy Sperling outfit, 12 arrests, Andy. no conviction, started as a rum runner back. Hmm? Hey, this is Tony Ricardo? It's the guy. Hmm. I would have sworn the man I talked to over the phone was in his 20s. Late 20s at most. You talked to him? After leaving an unpleasant little note under my door at the towers, he called me on the phone. Now, what kind of note? Oh, nothing particular. Just a gentle suggestion I lay off Carol Sharp. Threat, huh? Still got it? But I'm sure that voice couldn't have come from this old geezer. Yeah, well, frankly, I kind of wondered about the Sharp girl being interested in him, even though the file does show he's always surrounded himself with a bunch of young ones. He... You know, he's probably handed out more mink coats. Oh, Johnny, yeah, wait a minute. Uh, old Tony's got a couple of kids. Here, Angela. Goes under the name of Angela Richards. At least she used that name at Bryn Mawr. Bryn Mawr? Yeah, and Sarah Lawrence College at Bronxville. Yeah, the old boy tried to keep the stigma of his past away from her, I guess. Yeah, you see, uh, married to a doctor over in Hackensack. Respectable housewife. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the other? Anthony Jr., age 26. That was uh, last year. Let's see, that makes him 27. Now, Rutgers University, class... Not much on him. Unless I miss my guess, he's a chip off the old block. Well, you know where I can find him? All I have is his phone number. What is it? Wait till I see and talk to him. Yeah, that may be too late. He's what I think he is. Why not ask this medium about him tonight? Yeah, that... Hey, come on, we're late. Let's go. Item 8, twenty. Cab to an old brownstone house somewhere over in the West 40s. Way west in a district that had seen better days. We were greeted at the door by a tall, gray-haired old gentleman, dressed in black, except for his white gloves, that somehow reminded me of a pallbearer. Come in, Mr. Singer and Mr. Dollar. Clarabelle is about to begin. Psychometry is the mood this evening. Follow, please. How do you know our names? Oh, I had to give them to him when I made the appointment. Now, what's this uh, psychometry business? You'll see. Oh, wow. Music gives me the creeps. Yeah, I... Th Shh. Into the temple, please. And be seated. 
The temple turned out to be an old dining room. Bare wooden floor, heavy drapes over the windows. And as nearly as I could see, a bunch of chairs around in a circle filled with people. The sockets in the ancient chandelier that hung from the ceiling had red bulbs in them that barely glowed. We could hardly see a thing, although I'm sure the light went up very slightly when we made our entrance and then down again, as though somebody was controlling it with a rheostat. Our eyes were almost used to the semi-darkness by the time we seated ourselves in the circle. Nobody spoke, and the weird music from that scratchy record was beginning to get on my nerves or put me to sleep or something. I'm not quite sure what. Then, suddenly, there was a flash of light and a puff of smoke, and so help me... What the sand? Randy. Shh, quiet. This is all part of the act. Shh. Greetings. Greetings, 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 friends of the unknown, friends of the mystics, of Botan the Indian boy, and the seventh son of a seventh son, of Harry Shnoo the mighty. And there she stood, in the center of the circle where the flash had gone off. Are we all in? She stood there draped in what looked, even in the dim light, what looked like a slightly soiled bed sheet, pulled in around her ample middle with a hunk of coarse rope. She wore a sort of turban, or maybe it was just an old dish towel wrapped around her head. A faint odor of gin pervaded the room. I guess her feet were bare, for she made no noise as she walked slowly around the circle holding on a shallow metal tray. Taking a collection so soon, I wondered? Each of you place upon the tray some object. Very close to you. Something you have had a long, long time that has become a part of you. Huh? Shh, you'll get it back. And if the spirits are with us and there are no dissenting minds among us, if Botan, the Indian boy from the world beyond, is willing to act as our control, we shall learn many strange things this night. Place something close to you upon the tray. Uh, will this watch me on? You must not speak, but keep the mood. Keep the mood. Are we all in the mood? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, we are. And now, dear friends, while I meditate and establish contact with the spirit world, Henningway will pass among you for the tiny assurance that you join us in all sincerity. Now join hands to create the flux that will join our thoughts and minds and hearts and open the doors to enlightenment for all of us. Five dollars. Botan, are you with us tonight? Five dollars, please. Botan? Will you answer $5, us? $5. Are you with us now? Is that Botan that answers our call? Or the little sister, Hyacinth? Ah, it is Botan. We may begin. I hold this ring. I feel the paramagnetic forces arising from it. This belongs to a businessman south of here. I seem to see clothing hanging in a large warehouse. Yes, yes. And the sound of many machines, sewing machines. Yes, yes, that's right. And many young girls working at the machines. One by one, she picked the objects off the tray, held them in her hand, and gave a kind of character reading of the owners. Occasionally, somebody in the circle would respond in a way that made it sound like she'd guessed right. Other times, she'd just make with a lot of generalities that could apply to anyone. Finally, she picked up my watch. This watch. I see tall buildings of stone and strange signs on them. I don't know what they mean. Tri-mutual, universal adjustment. Huh? Randy. And I see great sheaves of papers, carefully folded. And on each one, it says, policy... Policy, I don't understand unless... Insurance, yes. This is fantastic. Wait till she gets to one I put there. The watch is from a young man. Clever, energetic. I will have many things to tell him at another time. But he must see me again. Often. And now, this other object that lay beneath the watch... I see a police badge. The cops! Oh, right. Dirty crooks, the cops are on to us. We're being raided. Get them out of here. Head away. Anyway. Get, get, get out of here. Come on, Tommy. I may need a hand. Just a minute, 
Mayor's whereabouts. Take your filthy hands off me. Let me out of here. You're not going anywhere until I have a talk with you. Anyway. Ditched me, ran out on me. I might have known he would at a pinch. There isn't going to be a pinch if you'll just shut up and stand still a minute. I wasn't doing no harm, honest officer, and, and all the money goes to charity. All right, all right. Settle down. Where's the light switch? Got it, Randy. I'll never live this down. Now, look, officer. You look, Clarabelle. All we want is some answers to some questions. And you won't pinch me? Not if you tell the truth, Johnny. Yeah. Just how did you know so much about me? It certainly wasn't from holding that watch. Okay, so it wasn't. Though some there are who can do it that way. That I've heard. Well, go on. No pinch? No pinch. Well, when your friend called to arrange a being here tonight, Henningway... That bum, he would walk out on me. Go on, would you? Well, Henningway asked where you come from, so we'd know if the spirits was propitious there. That's what we always said. And I told him Hartford. That's right. So what's Hartford? Insurance. If a client's in insurance, he responds like you done. So I keep pushing it. And if he ain't, well, at least he thinks I done pretty good by describing the place he comes from. Yeah. What about the clothing maker right at the beginning? <laughs> Easy. He called from a hotel, so he calls the hotel back and gets his address. You told him he was from the south of here. Sure. Woodbine, New Jersey. Only business down there of any account is clothing and small farms. Well, where'd you find that out? State directory, any library. And anybody could see he was a businessman, not a farmer. Well, I'll be. And hooking him that way tonight, you could have had him coming back as long as he could afford it, huh? Sure. And if it hadn't been for you, you okay, double cross. Okay, okay. Now, what about the others? Some we get the dope on and some we guess at. But there's always enough good ones to keep going. So easy. And yet, I must confess she'd had me stop for a while. We talked with her a bit longer. Randy warned her to watch her step and we left. Took a taxi back to my hotel. Well, did you learn anything? I should hope to tell you. What did the church-going spiritualists think of her kind? They hate him, and I don't blame him. Hmm. Are you still going to see Madame Morgana Morgana tomorrow night? Hmm, yeah. Well, mister, that one won't be so easy to expose. If you can expose her. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the medium well done appears. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Carol, Johnny. Oh, hello, Carol. I've made the arrangements for us to go to the seance tonight with Madame Morgana Morgana. Good. What time? Eight o'clock. Only it's across the river in New Jersey. Will you have dinner with me? I'd love to. But we'd better make it pretty early. Pick you up in your penthouse at six? I'll be waiting, Johnny. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York City. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. Some pretty strong pressure was being put on Carol Sharp to change the beneficiaries of her $110,000 life policy. And she was very much under the influence of a psychic medium who insisted that she be named as one of the two new beneficiaries. The other was to be a Tony Ricardo, whose father made quite a record for himself in the bootlegging gangster days of the Roaring Twenties. I met him at Susan Palmer's Oyster Bar over in Radio City. I must admit I was surprised at the sort of fellow he turned out to be. I guess it was a little, well, extreme to threaten you that way, Mr. Dollar. That's putting it mildly. But this whole spiritualism business and the hold it has on Carol, well, it has me terribly concerned. You don't like spiritualism? I didn't say that. You know, just as well as I do, there are a great many fine, honest spiritualists in the city. But as in any other field, there are frauds, racketeers. So I've heard. It's not only true of religions, but businesses, professions, anything, you know. Sure, sure. But now look here, Tony. Dollar, I will not have you or anyone else leading Carol on. 
this medium who's already has such a hold on it. Do you understand? Pardon me, Tony. Your background is showing. What? I say come off it. This kind of act won't work. What are you talking about? Do you think I don't know you're one of the two Carol wants to name as beneficiaries of her policy? You and that medium? That's not my doing. Whose doing is it? That medium, Morgana Morgana. She's been taking Carol's money by the hundreds week after week. Now you've come along to encourage her, and Della, I tell you to stop it. Tony. Maybe that story you gave her about dreaming of her over and over when you were a kid and couldn't even have known about it was true, but I don't believe it. Tony, that. that was made up out of whole cloth. I still... What? This funny decision to switch your policy around is the case I'm assigned to. Wait a minute, you mean that... Yes. I had to meet her somehow, so I used that device, knowing she might fall for it because of her implicit belief in such things. Yes, but now you're encouraging this whole thing. You're even going to see this Morgana Morgana with her tonight. Because if she is a phony, it's the only way I can show this to Carol. Well? I hope and pray that you can, Mr. Dollar. Some of the best psychic investigators in the country have been stumped by her. How are you going to go about it? I won't know until I've seen her operate. Even then, I may not know. Or maybe this medium isn't a fraud. Oh, come on, of course she is. But you can't prove it. But you or somebody must. Or Carol will change her policy and... And and then turn up dead. Won't be easy, Mr. Dollar. I've attended these seances with Carol, many of them. There have been times when I've almost been convinced myself. Waiter. Waiter, some more coffee, please. No, no, no more for me, thanks. You're going to need it, Tony, because I'm going to keep you here until you've told me every detail you can remember of this Madame Morgana Morgana seance procedure. All right, I'll help you all I can. You'd better. I'm still not forgetting that if I fall down on this job, you'll cut into Carol's insurance for a neat $30,000, in spite of your sweet talk. I'll say this for Tony Ricardo. He was thorough. And I began to believe that he was serious in his concern for Carol. Item 12, 10 cents, one fold call to Tommy Green. No, no, Johnny, no trouble at all in getting the rundown on Carol's family that she has for her. Keep talking. Apparently, they're doing all right there in Mochunk, PA. Uh, neither the mother or two brothers will ever have to really get out and dig for a living. Their old man left them well set up, huh? Yeah. Uh, one of the boys, Harold's, turned out pretty well. Works in some office over there, even though he doesn't really need to. What about the other boy? That'll be Dave, the black sheep of the family. Travels with a fast crowd, tears around the country in a sports car, that sort of thing. Oh. Right now, he's somewhere here in New York, just playing around. But, uh, Johnny, are you getting anywhere on this case? Yeah, Tommy, I think I am. Especially after what you just told me. Huh? Item 13, another phone call. This time to Sergeant Randy Singer at 18th Precinct Headquarters. Yeah, Johnny? Got a real easy one for you. What's that? Find a man. Name is David Sharp. Home address, Mockchunk, Pennsylvania. Chunk, Pennsylvania. Got it. Description? None, though he's probably in his 20s. Well, that's not and enough. And he's probably staying at a hotel here in the city. Well, yeah, but where? What part of the city? Let me know when you find out, will you? Yeah, now, wait a minute, Kate. To... Expense account item 14, $106.80, and it includes cabs to several camera shops. One miniature camera with an F2 lens, a couple of rolls of special film, some very special flash bulbs, and a tiny flash holder. Item 15, taxi back to the towers to clean up and dress for my date with Carol. Then the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. We located David Sharp for you, Johnny. Just dumb luck. Now, who knows, Randy? Maybe you're psychic. Nah, leave us not have that stuff. Where is he? Found him staying at the third hotel we called, the Aberran over on East 53rd Street. Not two blocks from that palatial joint where you're staying. Is he there now? No, but he always comes in just before dinner time. Hey, you still haven't told me why you're interested in him. I'm not sure myself. But do me a favor, will you? Like what? When he shows up, put a tail on him. I want to know where he goes, how long he stays, and when he comes back. But you won't say why? Not until I'm sure I know why. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, but I haven't said Thanks, I... boy. Dinner with Carol could have been one of the pleasantest things in years. But I'm afraid I was preoccupied with matters at hand and she with anticipation. She's promised to try to hear from Daddy again tonight. Oh, Johnny, I so want to speak to him again. Finally, I signed the check. We hopped into a taxi and headed across the river to the Jersey side. We ended up at a rather plain but nice home somewhere on the outskirts of, I guess, it's Union City. We were met at the door by a matron of about 45, I should say, who looked like an ordinary, respectable housewife, except perhaps for her quick, discerning eyes. Good evening, Carol, my dear. Oh, and you must be Mr. Johnny Dollar. Yes, uh, Madam Morgana Morgana? Yes, do come in and meet the others who are here to form the circle tonight. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Carol told me nothing about you except your veridical dreams of her. 
An amazing experience, isn't it? Perhaps you're really psychic. Oh, I, I doubt that. But all our friends thought my kid brother Richard was before he died a couple of years ago. Richard. Richard. That name has been haunting me ever since Carol telephoned. You don't suppose... What, madame? Oh, no, of course not. Now, um, here in the parlor are the others who will be with us tonight. Uh, may I present Mr. Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Dorothy Jessup... How do you do? Mr. John Price... Hello. Mr. Samuel Froelich... Hello. And, of course, you all know Carol Sharp. Good evening. I see no reason why we shouldn't start. The atmosphere has seemed almost electric tonight. Very conducive to good contact with the... Shall we say the netherworld... Oh, oh, yes, you may smoke if you like, Mr. Dollar. We're very informal. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Just sort of a nervous habit, I guess, flicking this lighter. Oh, um, incidentally, I... <sighs> I hope you tell these people of your dreams after we're finished. <sighs> oh, dear. The atmosphere is tense. We should begin right away. Well, yes, I'll... I'll... Turn on some low music. The six of us sat down in a small circle. On the floor were three long, slender metal trumpets, like Halloween horns, but made of thin metal, spaced about the center of the circle. In the subdued conversation of the next few minutes, I learned it was through these that the spirit voices would come to us, that they would rise in the air and the voices would issue from them. From time to time, there in the pitch black room, I snapped the cap of my lighter as a reminder of what it was. You mustn't light it, Johnny, you know. No danger. This one hasn't even got a flint in it. I do hope we get some messages today. I think we will, Mr. Froelich. I have a feeling that we will. I have that feeling, too. Very strongly. From what Madame told us, you must have definite psychic powers, Mr. Dollar. That should be helpful. Wait. Wait. The power is here. I feel it. Almost as though she were suffering Come physical to us. pain. We are ready. The medium sighed and gasped. And we waited and waited. <laughs> it's hard to describe the tension that comes of waiting that way in a completely darkened room. And it's easy to see how well the imagination can work, the powers of suggestion. There was a slight sound. <laughs> One of the trumpets. I heard it move. Yes. Yes, so did I. That means that they are with us. Seem to move toward you, Carol. I, I hope so. Yes. Yes, I can feel it in the air near me. Father? Father? Carol. Carol. Oh, Father, can you speak to me? There's so many things I wish to ask you. Yes, dear. Yes. Yes. It may not sound like much to tell, but believe me, this was impressive. The death-like silence broken only by the faint voice from the trumpet, the whispered questions by Carol, an occasional sigh from the medium, and the shudder of my special little camera, which I hope sounded enough like my lighter had sounded. Yes, Carol. Always do the things I tell you to. You are a good girl, my darling. And you give me great happiness. In this lonely... In this... Father? Father? Goodbye, my... Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Oh, Johnny, do you see? Do you see? Because only he and I know the things we talked about. Wait. I feel the trumpet is still near us, and John. perhaps... John. John. Mr. Dollar, it's for you. Yes? Richard? Yes, John. Dick. I've waited so long to speak to you. Dick. My brother. The brief conversation I carried on with my dead brother Richard was amazing. Of things in my childhood that I thought nobody else even knew about. Personal, intimate things that can only be known to a brother or someone equally close. It was fantastic, amazing, awe-inspiring. Except for one thing. I never had a brother. I didn't tell this to anyone. I played it straight and even stayed around and discussed my trumped-up dreams after the seance. 
But I needed proof, and I couldn't wait to get back to New York to the police lab where I could develop the infrared film in my little camera. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up. And a bit of heartbreak for a very chastened girl. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Johnny. This is Carol. Oh, hi, Carol. Sleep well? Johnny, you were so quiet on the way back from the seance last night. I hope it's because Madame Morgana Morgana convinced you of her powers as a medium. Uh, how much did you pay her for that seance, Carol? A hundred dollars. A hundred... Want to meet me in the coffee shop downstairs for breakfast? I'd love to. Fifteen minutes? Fifteen minutes. Goodbye. Oh, and weren't you thrilled to hear the voice of your dead brother again? Yeah. Bye. Except that I never had a brother. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly... Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, New York City. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenses during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. Expense account item 18, 10 cents, phone call to Carol Sharp. Item 19, 10 cents, phone call to Sergeant Randy Singer. Hey, I thought you were coming down here to headquarters this a.m. It's nearly 10 o'clock. As soon as I've had some breakfast, your lab get those films developed for me? They're working on them right now. And did you put a tail on David Sharp? Carol's brother? Yeah. I suppose you know he was over there in the neighborhood of that seance over in Jersey last night. I would have bet on it. Didn't you see him there? No. Well, that's funny. Just keep that tail on him. See you later. Item 20, 1070, long-distance call to the city editor of the Mock Chunk Pennsylvania Herald Express. For a full half hour, I asked him questions about the Sharp family, about one member of the family in particular. Then, item 21, 585, breakfast for Carol and myself in the coffee shop at the Swank Bell Towers. You must have been impressed, Johnny. You're so quiet. Would you like to see Madame Morgana Morgana again tonight? Johnny? Carol, I think we'll see her today. Oh, but she couldn't. She always says it takes a full day to recover from the shock and strain of a seance. She goes into a deep trance, you know, in order to make the spirits move those little trumpets about and speak through them. Listen, Carol. Yes? You have a brother, David. Oh, David. Why do you say it that way? He's not really a brother. He was just sort of taken in by mother when his parents died. I'd rather not speak of him, Johnny. The black sheep of the family, huh? Mother, Mother insisted on taking care of him. He was only 12 or 13. I've forgotten. Father didn't want to, but he permitted it. Why didn't he want to? Because David's father had been a criminal, and his father before him, even David's mother was... uh, And my father was afraid. Yeah, but blood would tell. Yes. Your father left money to him, along with the rest of you. Yes, he did. But not as much. And David has resented that. But no matter how much he had, he, he wouldn't have enough. His sports cars, the fast company. Johnny, how did you know about that? Listen, Carol... I'm an insurance investigator. What? I came down here to look into this matter of your wanting to change the beneficiaries of your policy to cut off your mother and brothers in favor of this medium and Tony Ricardo. Johnny, I hate you for this. Why didn't you... I didn't dare let you know until I found out a few things. This is the most... And I think I have. Including the fact that Madame Morgana Morgana, who persuaded you to make the change, is nothing but a clever fraud. No, that isn't true. And I'll prove it to you. If you'll call your boyfriend, Tony Ricardo... Tony... Take him down to the 18th Precinct Police Station where I'll be waiting for you. But Tony hasn't... You think because his father was a kind of gangster years ago... In Tony's case, I hope blood won't tell. 18th Precinct, both of you. All right, Johnny, we will be there. Johnny, the picture took last night. Oh, thanks, Randy. Hmm. Uh-huh. Hey, why'd you ever get the idea of using infrared light and infrared film? Anything else, anything that let them know I was taking pictures would have busted up the seance. Hey, look at this one. 
Yeah, you know, I'd like to publish those. Scare a lot of those phony psychics out of business and out of town. Oh, here's the one that I'd oh, like. Oh, Mr. Dollar, we're here. Hi, Dollar. Oh, hello, Tony. Miss Sharp, Mr. Ricardo, this is Sergeant Singer. How do you do? Hi. And now, will you please show us this proof you were talking about? Yes, Dollar. How did you make out, huh? Made out very well, Tony. Thanks to a miniature flash camera I had tucked into my pocket last night. I guess you wondered, too, how Madame Morgana Morgana worked her record. He did not. Tony knows as well as I do that she's completely honest. Like any normal person, he may have questioned the almost miraculous powers of this woman in the beginning. But no trumped-up tricks that you... Where, where did you get this picture? And look at this one. Oh, she... She's moving that trumpet herself. With the long, kind of extended handles. Extension grip, they call it. She probably hid it in the front of her dress. Oh, no. But these pictures in that dark room, I... Infrared photography. Maybe she did use one trick. But the voices came from trumpets floating about in the air above yeah. our head. Then look at this one. Taken when your father was supposed to be speaking to you. Oh, no. That little trumpet has a long tube on it. Yep. Extending into that curtain doorway at the end of the room where somebody could whisper through it. Oh, this is terrible. And the hundreds, the thousands of dollars I gave her, believing in her. Yep. I'm afraid you were really took... Here. Here's where my dead brother, Richard, spoke to me. The hanging trumpet is over your head. Yeah. But how could she know? I didn't tell her... Oh, yes, you mentioned your brother. A completely non-existent brother, Carol. Oh. Made up. Like the dream of you I told you about. And I believed you, too. But how could she find out all those things about me? Miss Sharp, a couple of nights ago, I took Mr. Dollar to a medium that was a bum compared to this one. She told him all about himself. Have you forgotten what I found out about you and your brothers just in the last 24 hours? Oh, I... I don't know what to say. Don't try. We've still got to pin this whole thing down. I'm sure this Madame Morgana Morgana wasn't working alone. But who could be... How about it, Tony? No. No, not Tony. Just because his father was... Oh, no, please. Oh, thanks, Tony. I got a report here, Johnny. Apparently he's moved again. And you guessed right. Yeah. Then we better get going. Can we use a prowl car? No, but we can get an escort as far as the city line. Then come on, all of you. The cabbie with his accelerator on the floor had a ball training our escort across town. And we had to hold him down when we finally reached the Jersey side. Randy Singer obviously had no authority over there. But as it turned out, I'm glad he came. When we pulled up to the home of Madame Morgana Morgana, I couldn't help noticing a Studebaker Golden Hawk sticking out from behind the house with a Pennsylvania license. I wasn't the only one to notice it. Johnny, that looks like David's car. I think it is. Come on. Hey, Johnny, I'm out of my jurisdiction. Oh, yeah, maybe you better wait. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Johnny, I knew David was bad, but... Uh, oh, I still can't believe it. I know how you feel, Carol, and I'm sorry. Mr. Dollar... Wait a minute. Johnny. Johnny, if you do a thing like this... I'm he'd... ready for anything. Look, Mr. Dollar, why don't just you and I go in? If anything happened to Carol, I'd never... Oh, Carol, dear. And Mr. Ricardo and Mr. Dolly. Hello, Madame Morgana. Do you mind if we come in? Why, no. I... But not for another meeting, of course. The strain of last night's convocation is still with me, I'm afraid. Yeah, maybe you ought to uh, up the price for your next seance. But there ain't gonna be no more. Mr. Dollar, I don't understand. Come on, Carol, Tony. We're going to look over that seance room in broad daylight. No, you can't. I I won't let you destroy the sanctity of that room. Oh, yes, you will. I'll lay it on the line to you, madam, whatever your name really is. This monkey business of yours has gone far enough. So this is the room. What terrible things you're saying. You take a thing like spiritualism that a lot of honest people believe in and make a dirty racket out of it. Carol, this man is mad. Make him leave this sacred place at once. Carol, what right have you to make such horrible implications? Implications? Those were accusations. Would you like to see how those spirits of yours move trumpets around in the dark? They couldn't be seen. And how those spirit voices suddenly appear out of thin air? Look at these pictures. Oh. How did you get these? I cannot tell a lie. I did it with my little camera. Well? All right. All right. You've exposed me. But there was nothing malicious about it. If you knew the solace, the comfort of mind and spirit these things have brought to the people who come to me. At a hundred bucks a crack, sometimes more. Why not? Carol has money. 
So have the others who come to me. Did you plan to make them all turn their insurance policies over to you? And then contrive to have them suddenly and unexpectedly join their immortal ancestors in the great beyond? No, no, that wasn't my idea. Oh, oh, I knew something like this might happen. It has happened. Now, where is he? He's... No. No, I, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. Your assistant or colleague in crime would be a better word who stood inside the curtain door of the seance room and made with the phony voices of the dead, who gave you all the information on Carol who's probably done a nice little research job on me since my visit last night. Yes, Mr. Dollar. David. I know all about your activity as an insurance investigator and why you're here. But it's not going to do you any good. Oh, put that thing down and give yourself up, David. So you're the one who arranged for me to be a beneficiary of Carol's policy, Stand huh? Stand back. So the suspicion would fall on me when something happened to her? Of course. And give us a chance to clear out. But now it's too late. And now that you've found us out... Well... David, No! <laughs> The light, somebody turned off. Look out, Della, look out! Are you dirty? Pull a gun on me, will you? Easy, easy, Johnny. Control yourself. I'll knock you. Randy. Yeah. If you'll just get up off my chair. Here, here the lights. But David. When I flicked off the lights, Tony here made a dive for him. There he is, wrapped up in the corner there. Yeah, I've got his gun. Oh, you got a mean left there, Johnny. Oh, I'm sorry, Randy, but... See, I thought this was out of your jurisdiction. <laughs> I get curious about comparing your lousy photography with the room itself, Johnny, so I sneaked in the back door. When I saw what was going on, I... Well, I, I lost my head, I guess. All right, Dave, up on your feet. Oh, Johnny. Easy, Carol. Better get her out of here, Tony. Yeah, sure. And remember that crack about blood will tell... Well, I think you can prove to her that in your case, at least, whoever said it was all wet. Well, what happens to David Sharp and Madame Morgana Morgana will be up to the courts. It's a cinch she's out of the ghost racket for a while. A long while. And, of course, Carol did make a change in her policy to cut off David. Expense account, item 20-something, cab back to New York, hotel bill, and fare back to Hartford. 4 17 Expense account total... Eight ninety two ninety. Oh, and if you don't mind, I'll hang on to that tricky little camera and stuff in case I run into another medium well done. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week, the tears of night matter. A fabulous necklace and a fabulous girl. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Lauren Stubkin, Lorene Tuttle, Harry Bartell, Eleanor Audley, Joseph Kearns, Herb Vigran, Junius Matthews, Tony Barrett, and Sam Edwards. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. Thank you.